John, let's start off right with the cold kiss. Okay. Um, first off, what, what's it about for people who aren't familiar with it? Uh, it's the story of a couple traveling from Minneapolis to Reno to get married and start a new life. They, uh, they make a stop at a diner in, in the Midwest and end up picking up a hitchhiker who is who's sick, obviously sick, but he offers them $500, and being a, a new poor couple, they jump at the chance. Mm -hmm. um, then they get trapped in a blizzard, the guy dies in the car, and it just unravels from there, and they, they discover he's got $2 million in cash in his suitcase, and, and they make some bad choices. And yeah, they, they make some really bad choices. <laughs> so that, the, that goes without saying. And now the, the couple, they end up getting stranded at a motel. They it? do. Okay, so... and. Uh, basically, it almost becomes like a trap room um, style style crime novel when right. it comes right down to it. Yeah, and that was one of the things I wanted to kind of to do when I was writing it. My, I, it didn't really turn out the way I was thinking um, because originally I wanted to sort of juxtapose a cozy novel with a full out noir violent novel, mm -hmm. and. Um, sort of have them butt heads in the middle of it, and that was my intention with it, and I think I succeeded in, in some ways, but, you know. No, I, I think you have very, very well uh, when it comes right down to it. Now, um, basically, they get trapped at this motel, and when it comes right down to it, they run into probably one of the more unique antagonists that I've seen in a novel in a while, where basically we have um, the nephew of the motel owner. Mm -hmm. uh, explain a little bit about him, as far as... Zach. Yeah. Um... Zach is a religious fundament, fundamentalist, um, but not not as sane as a religious fundamentalist would be, um, if that tells you anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's he's basically he deals meth to support um, his anti-abortion crusade, in mm -hmm. the, and and that's that's sort of where we'll we can leave that. Guy. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> where did you come up with the idea for this type of this type of villain? I mean, that that's where he is, you know, he's this guy who's obviously found God, but mm -hmm. he's doing, fighting the crusade through a criminal inter enterprise. Right. And justifies it, too. Yeah, and absolutely justifies it. But, I mean, where did the whole idea of that come from? I mean... You know, as with any idea, you get bits and pieces of it at a time, and, and usually it sort of creates itself in layers. I think when, when he first popped into the story, originally he wasn't even in the book, and he just sort of developed during the writing, he just popped in as a as a meth dealer, and then, um, you know, certain scenes j they just start you thinking down the line of, you know, well, who could this person be? You know, what is his background? And he and they just sort of develop in layers. Mm -hmm. So, um, there was really no inspiration for him, or you know, there wasn't somebody that I was modeling him on or anything mm -hmm. like that. He just sort of came about organically through the story. Yeah, it, like I said, when when I actually started reading into the character, it just how unique. I, I just hadn't really run into an antagonist like that before. Now, with the cold kiss, this this almost didn't happen with, with this novel. Correct. Okay. So, what was going on with it? What made you kind of put a stop to it? Uh, at the time, I had I had written one other novel called The Grove that was that was being shopped around, and while it was being shopped around, I had written the first seventy pages of this, and. I was getting a lot of feedback from editors in New York about The Grove, about it being too dark, um, you know, too in-between genres, things like that. And then I started to look at what I was writing here, and, and like we talked about, it had that really claustrophobic feel to it. And, and it's, a, it's a dark novel, you know. It's, there's, you know, a lot of bad characters. There's, you know, just this, the situation that they find themselves in is, is you know, a really... Well, like I said, claustrophobic situation. Right. So I just thought, you know, this isn't going to happen. I wasn't too excited with what I'd written. I thought I'd have a better shot publishing a book if I moved on. Um, and so I just I put it aside and I didn't touch it again. I printed out the pages and you know set them on my on my bookshelf and left it alone. Mm -hmm. And um, about a month later, my wife read them and loved them. Said, you know, I I want to know what's going on with these people. And you know, this is really great. And I went back and and read it, and there was a definite energy to the first 70 pages of this book, and it created a sense of dread um, that I'm always trying to do, you know, this, this sort of impending doom that's coming, and that you know is coming, and I thought, it, I thought, you know, on a second reading, I said, yeah, that's, that's actually there, so mm -hmm. I kept going. And I decided to move forward. And I did. <laughs> lucky, lucky enough with that. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the growth. Okay. Um, you know, basically, your agent shopped this around just getting rejections left and right from it. 
very close calls. I mean, it, it wasn't like, you know, I know this book is terrible, we hate it. It was, mm-hmm. it was like, I love this book, I sent it around the office, you know, but when it, when it came to marketing, you know, they don't know, does it go in the horror section, does it go in the crime section, mm-hmm. you know, is it a mystery? They had no idea what to do with it, and, and unfortunately in today's publishing world, that, that will stop you cold, mm-hmm. you know, right there. And, and so because they couldn't pigeonhole it, I got, I got a lot of rejections for it. You know, very, very few people didn't like the book. I ran into a few that were just, you know, like I said before, that was, this is too dark, you know, right. it's, you know, we can't have it. But no. And what was the decision, and this is something I've asked you before as well, too, is the, um, why did you decide to go with Kindle Publishing as opposed to, like, going with the smaller press? Um, <clears throat> I went with the Kindle because I didn't consider it self-publishing at the time, and, um, I didn't consider it self-publishing at the time because nobody else was doing it. And I don't know why I didn't consider it self-publishing, but, you know, there's a definite stigma attached to it. And I just thought, if I put it out on the Kindle, maybe a few hundred people will download it. I can start building an audience, start building a platform, um, which is something that, you know, the big New York City publishers look for. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's what I did, and that's that's why I went that route. Um, at the time, Forge, Tor Forge had the cold kiss, and they had been sitting on it for eight months, I think, and we kept getting emails from my editor saying, I want to buy this book, you know, I'm, you know, we're very interested in this book, we're just trying to figure out how to do it. So I thought if I could, you know, show them, hey, I could sell a couple hundred copies of this book on the Kindle, that maybe, you know, that would push them in the direction I wanted them to go. Mm-hmm. Then, but, you know, it sold a lot more than a couple hundred copies yeah. right out of the gate. So. Now, I know you see the numbers on, on the Kindle sales. How many copies of it have you sold at this point? Uh, well, I took it off several months ago after after um, Amazon called me about the Encore deal, and um, I, I had sold I sold I think a thousand copies in the f- definitely in the first month, um, closer to two thousand in the first month, mm-hmm. and then it started tapering off a little bit. I think I think at the after about three or four months I had sold about five thousand copies, and then um, and then it just sort of tapered down to maybe a couple hundred copies a month from then on. It's still, a couple hundred copies a month for oh, it's, for a Kindle book is phenomenal. Fantastic! Yeah, yeah I, I, I was very happy. No, yeah, I'm very surprised. Yeah, absolutely, I, I and I'm pleasantly surprised. It is a fantastic novel. Uh, I, I, honestly, for a debut, it was very maturely written. And but we'll go a little into this now. Amazon approached you about mm-hmm. actually doing a print edition right. of the Grove. All right. Yeah. So now, how has that relationship been working out? Have you been dealing with them kind of like the same way you have been with Forge, or? Yeah, it's, they're they're just another publisher, and mm-hmm. and yeah, they, they emailed me I think back in December or January and said they wanted to to publish the book under Amazon Encore, mm-hmm. and what that is is they'll put out a print edition, um, I think it's a trade paperback, and they'll re-release it on the Kindle, mm-hmm. they'll redesign the cover, um, and then use their entire you know promotions machine behind it mm-hmm. to get the word out. It just seemed like a, a great idea, and you know the book wasn't doing anything, and so we jumped at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, will it be distributed exclusively through Amazon, or will it be actually be in Barnes and Noble, the mystery bookstores across the country, or is it going to just be on Amazon? Um, it's going to be at Barnes and Noble. It's actually got a. They made a, a pretty big order for furniture replacement in Barnes and Nobles around the country, so so that's going to be nice. Um, as far as the independents go, I'm, I'm probably going to have to talk them into that because it's still Amazon we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And independent stores and, and Amazon don't always see eye to eye, ever. So. Yeah. No, they rarely, if ever, do. But <laughs> hopefully I'll get them to carry it. Uh, yeah, hopefully so. You know, so um, next book with Forge. All right, is that completed? Has it been turned in? Um, we're not sure if it's going to be with Forge or not. They have the option. Um, the book is done. I just, I just finished it last month, and I'm finishing up edits. Um, as we speak, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to be sending it to Forge at the end of the month. They have the option for it, mm-hmm. and um, uh, it's under contract with Simon and Schuster in the UK. But but here, it, there's just an option for it. So we'll see. We'll see okay. what happens. Uh, do you have a title for it yet? Do you have? No, no, <laughs> nothing definite. I, I've noticed that with a lot with you, you have always untitled novel on, yeah. on the fronts of your manuscripts. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Um, Titles come late. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you basically. Well, it, that's not not necessarily a bad thing, right there. So, um, any other plans with Amazon after the Grove? I'd I'd love to give them something else. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it, it all depends on how it goes, you know, but from what I've heard from other Encore authors and, and just seeing how those books are selling, um, you know, I, I, I would love to sort of work both sides of the fence if I can, mm -hmm. you know, it just depends on how fast I can write them, I guess, and who, and who wants them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, yeah, I've, I've, my experience with Amazon has been fantastic, you know, it's great. That's great. Well, they seem like a great company to work for. Um, so far. Yeah. So, well, John, I, I really appreciate the time today, sir. No, and, thank you. And like I said, uh, once again, guys, this is Keith Rawson from Spine Tingler Magazine. This was John Rector. Thanks a lot, John.